right, so my, my assumption for this presentation is that you've just sat through the last two presentations. So um, I don't really do a lot of, uh, of uh, explanation about what swordfish is at this point, or redfish or anything like that. So we're going to mostly just jump right into things here. Let's see. Um, so again, yes, building on the concepts presented in both the intro to redfish and swordfish sessions. Um, what we're actually going to talk about is uh, more. De uh, I'm going I'm to jump into a couple of different areas here. One of which is um, uh, the uh, kind of the overall sort uh, storage system and, and uh, uh, storage service concepts. But I really wanted to dig into a little bit on the class of service and give an example of, of how that works. Um, this is an area that um, we is, is kind of critical to the system, but um, you guys get brand new material today. We have not covered this, uh, covered this before, so um, uh, George is going to be sitting in the back critiquing me. Um, <laughs> Uh, the other thing we're actually going to do, and John talked a little bit about this um, first thing this morning, is I'm actually going to talk, because uh, and this is kind of a precursor to uh, the implementer stuff a little bit, is I'm actually going to talk uh, quite a bit about um, the uh, CSDL and, and JSON schema formats and just kind of show, you know, schema in quite a bit more detail. You know, what are the schema, how are they constructed? Because one of the things, once you start looking at the spec, you actually start digging into the schema quite a bit. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how those are constructed and what they look like and the two different formats and, you know, comparison of them side by side a little bit. So that's pretty much what we're gonna cover, uh, cover now, so. And uh, we'll see if George can, George can actually uh, comment, get, whether he'll actually uh, comment or not on the class of service stuff. Standard disclaimer and also the, the website. Um, again, standard.org slash swordfish. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't put my, uh, my three notices. Sorry, Linda. Um, the bowl is once again empty. So, <laughs> there is once again a giveaway. Another echo dot. Uh, so enter again for the, uh, enter again for the echo dot business card or your name and contact information um, and uh, make sure you make sure you put that in there uh, at the end and this is a smaller group you have a better chance this time so, so uh, the glass bowl up here Linda will take that around and make sure you get your your uh, information in there for that uh, second again reminder Twitter contest no one is tweeting, apparently except me, and, and I don't count, so I can't win. So, um, hashtag STC17, hashtag storage management. Apparently all you gotta do is have one tweet out there. <laughs> so, um, and what was the third one? Oh, take the coasters and the, uh, you can take the coasters with you and the two little, the swordfish cards. The little swordfish cards have the same information on the little bit of a blurb on there. Um, you're welcome to take those with you. All right. Standard disclaimer and reminder of the pointer to snea.org slash swordfish. All right. So, uh, you know, I said I wasn't going to do a lot of recap, but I'm going to give us a starting point, the resource map. We talked about, you know, here's, here's the basic redfish uh, resource structure. When we add swordfish, whoop, build, come on. There we go. When we build, we focus on and we add the storage systems and storage services. And so let's talk a little bit more about those swordfish concepts. Look, we're on slide nine already. We're just zipping right through here. Um, all right, so what are storage systems anyway? We, we, we said this a little bit already. But um, storage systems, again, it contains uh, those computer system uh, instances that are used for storage applications. And I, I mentioned this in the last presentation, but as you actually go, if you actually go look at the scheme and look at the spec, um, those are, the storage systems are actually exactly the same thing as computer systems. So what you'll actually see when you do a real implementation, if you're a real boy, um, you, will, you will actually see all of those storage systems actually show up in systems as well. 
Um, so there's a couple of different kinds of implementations you can do. You can do, um, you know, if you're doing like a, a, a Think of this as you know host-based management. If you're doing you know different that kind of management, host-based management that's got a lot of different systems as opposed to embedded management, you might see a, a system up here that's got um, it's got man servers and other things in it as well. Um, this storage system collection down here would only have your your storage systems in it. If the only thing you're managing is storage, these systems would be identical. Um, this becomes <laughs> relevant when there, there's also another class of, of uh, Redfish management ecosystem, a Redfish service that we call an aggregator. Because what you can actually do is build a Redfish service um, hierarchy. So an aggregator that's building up um, uh, a uh, management, so it's swordfish that manages swordfish, or Redfish that manages that manages, um, you know, based on, on different kinds of systems. So you could have a, a storage system that's built out, uh, you know, by pulling in um, servers, you know, it's composed, maybe, I hate to use the word composed because it's not really using a composability system that, that uh, John talked about earlier, but if you take my word composed and realize it's not that same one, it'll work. But that's comprised of, uh, um, you know, servers, um, and it's using those redfish that those uh, that redfish information, or even that swordfish information from different systems to build a bigger swordfish system. It you might see things in d those different structures. I'm probably going into too much detail there. I'll stop. Um, but uh, the key, kind of the key point is, you'll see it in both spots. Um, we will. You will see. People's implementations most likely telling you, look in storage systems to find them. Okay, storage uh, storage services again. We'll spend most of our time here. Um, so the storage system storage service instances manages all the different storage related functionality. Different implementations can choose how many different storage services they want to instrument. Um, they can support you know, one storage service per storage system, or they could support many. It's going to be kind of implementation specific. Um, uh, there are clearly some storage services you, or some storage systems you can look at today and think, yes, those will clearly support lots of storage services. Um, other kinds that it just clearly makes sense to only support one storage service. It's going to be completely implementation dependent, uh, specific as to how many storage services they choose to support. Um, this, so this has a redundancy um, element built into it. Uh, so um, it, we support implementations already working it either way. Um, Okay, so I'm kind of diving down into things that I didn't intend to, but you know, hey, that's okay. Uh, so the, the storage service again, we talked about this already. You know, class of service, volumes, file systems, storage pools, all of those things we saw in, as we were navigating around um, in the mockups earlier. Um, so let's take a, a, a more specific look at class of service. What is this thing? How is it structured? How does it work? So what I did in here was I put a, an example together that shows um, the very simple case of this for you. Um, because this thing can be structured in a very complex model as well. Uh, so classes of service are fundamentally are composed of lines of service. There are five different kinds of lines of service. Um, so there's data protection, data security, data storage, IO connectivity, and IO performance. And all of these have multiple attributes that you can associate with them, right? And so the way that you specify what uh, properties um, are available for each one of these are in 
capabilities, right? So what, what is your system capable of? Um, and so it's, again, it's kind of up to the implementation to say how flexible it wants to be. So if an implementation just wants to say, um, I'm going to, I'm going to just predefine a set of class of service. You won't need to see all this complexity. But if it's a large scale system, it's going to be deployed with a lot of different flexibility to it. You might see a lot of detail here and it might populate a whole bunch of capabilities so that a storage administrator could come in and configure a whole bunch of detail here. Um, so what I'm going to show you is actually a, a rel you know, you know, something that could be very, very tiny. So, um, the, the hierarchy here is kind of like you have this, again, you have this class of service that's comprised of lines of service. And then this detail down here where the definition of, the, of what, what's a, um, what you can specify for the lines of service uh, may be specified in those capabilities. Um, so, Again, very, very simple example here. Um, if you have a system that says, uh, I want to use a single property to define class, to, to define a class of service. Um, so I want to go in, um, and here, here is one property. Um, I go into the IO connectivity capabilities. There's a property called supported access properties. Uh, or support, sorry, supported access protocols. What that actually translates to is it's, it's actually connection type, but it really translates to drive type, right? So this is things like SAS, SATA, NVMe. It's got a bunch of other things in there too. But when you actually look at it, um, for these purposes, um, we can translate this to say, that's actually gonna tell me the drive type. So what I can do is actually I can go in and I can create a line of search, two lines, you know, lines of service that says all it is is this property. And I can create a line of service that says um, I want a line of service that says it's NVMe. I want a line of service that says it's SAS or SATA, um, right? And that actually says um, NVMe, I know that these are fast drives. These other ones aren't, effectively, right? So high capacity drives, high performance drives, right? So there, there I've got that, that piece done. Um, so here's our little eye chart. <laughs> so this is what this is kind of what I did here. Um, I put them, put them both on the same one, hopefully, so you can. Can, can kind of see this. So here's my one class of service um, named high capacity. Let me see if I can point it this way a little bit. So over here we've got high capacity and I created this line of service and it specifies this line of service down here where that same property, the access protocol, so SATA. And over here I've got another class of service. This is high performance and it's Access protocol is NVMe. So again, super simplified example. You you know, you could, but uh, you get the idea, right? I can use I I could get this as simple as one property that I could use to bubble this up to say, I want my sim my system to to have two classes of service keying off of one property. Okay, well, great. Now, how do I use it? You know, how what do I do now? How about these two classes of service? Um, so I've got classes of service defined, and so I uh, whoop, turn that off. So once the classes of service exist, whether I pre-built my system that way or whether I cre went and created them, um, then I use those classes of service when I create my storage pools. So there's multiple, you know, multiple ways you can actually do this, right? So I had a question earlier when, when, I, when we were looking at reviewing these slides about what, is the, what are we going to actually ask the implement, implementations to do here? Are the implementations going to um, 
uh, going to always create the lines of service and the class of service. Um, and the spec doesn't actually dictate this. Um, so one of the things we'll, we'll likely do as we start running through some of these initial implementations is start working on some best practices for this. Uh, and, and try and come up with some guidelines to say, you know, what should, you know, what do we recommend best, you know, implementations to do? Should we, should, should implementations generally have a couple of classes of service of, you know, at least one class of service, a default class of service that comes out of the box? Um, we don't require it now, but what's, what's the right best practice? Should they have at least one, you know, what, what would we recommend? Um, so I'll just head that question off because I know that one's likely to come. Um, okay, so when you go to create a, a class of service, there needs to be, uh, you need to specify, or sorry, when you create a storage pool, you need to specify then a class of service, whether it's you know, the default one for the system or you pick one. Um, and then, so you can go create multiple storage pools and have them all ready, or you can just do one, doesn't matter. And then when you go to allocate a volume, you use that attribute, um, you can use that, that class of service attribute to pick from either the one pool, you know, you, you know the pool, or you can, or from the set of pools, mm -hmm. to say, you know, pick which one to use, right? So we created that high performance, high capacity one. I can just say, hey, pick a pool that's got, you know, that's got that high performance cl class of service, and I need this much capacity. Or if I happen to know that, you know, pool, you know, uh, uh, Boston performance, um, you know, I create it as a, as a high performance pool, use that one. Um, so there's lots of different ways and it's kind of up to the, up to the, you know, the specifics of the configuration that for the naming and, and how you want to, how you want to do that. So here's kind of a, a, a quick example of this. Um, I actually pulled the template for this from our user's guide. Um, I haven't yet mentioned today our user's guide. Um, one of the things we released in, con in conjunction with our specification was uh, a user's guide which has a whole set of uh, example use cases from a client perspective for, uh, in, what do we have, about 20-ish use cases in there uh, for, uh, for things like, uh, you know, allocate volume with the default class of service, allocate volume with a specified class of service. Uh, so just to give folks an idea of how to interact with the Swordfish system. Um, so this is, this is one that would basically be, okay, how do I create a volume, right? So here's the post and here's kind of the, you know, what a body of the, of the post request would look like. So, you know, I specified its name, its capacity, and the uh, class of service that I'm looking for. That's about it. So none of that bothering with RAID levels, you know, which drives to use, uh, all of that kind of stuff is, you know, we didn't see any of that in any of this process. So, um, and the, the user's guide provides more context for how this whole use case works, um, but uh, it's really pretty straightforward. Yep. What would you get in the response on the HTTP code or uh, I think you, I think you pretty much get a success and I, and a potentially a pointer back to the volume, uh, depending on if it's created right away, and that's implementation specific. You might get a, a pointer to a task uh, if it's an if it's an if an implementation takes a while to create the volume. So it's one of those two things. It's either a task pointer. Um, or a pointer to the volume itself. Yep. The items inside parentheses, I just do those are essentially like indexes. You have storage services one, for example. Yeah, so. Is the one an index that the client side knows about, or what did that come from? 
So these, George, you want to explain the OData reference, the, the format there? There's two ways to specify keys, but they're keys. They're keys, okay. Okay. Uh, one's probably unfortunate because it's a small number and you think about it as an index, but in a real system it's likely to be uh, a UID that is real big. A high performance there, that was a term defined by the vendor implementation? That was that same class of service that I had no, in, previous. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. So the single manager of this whole thing basically have to drill down and decipher kind of what these different things mean if they were trying to provide a unified view of multiple systems from different vendors. Is that correct? Yeah, but um, those you know those names can be well. Some of this. Yes, yeah. So, the, so the, the names could be um, user-defined names, depending on depending on the specifics of the implementation, right? Um, some implementations may come with predefined classes of service. Uh, we would ex some may be entirely user-configured. So, okay. Um, let's see. All right. So that's you know kind of a quick over quicker than I, I went through that faster than I expected for some reason. Um, so, so, all right, so let's jump into schema a little bit. Um, so when you're actually starting to interact with and, and work through the spec and deal with, um, you know, looking at, at implementations, there's two different ways you'll be looking at schema, right? If you're, if you're building an, a server-side implementation or if you're doing, dealing with from a client perspective, but um, uh, let me just kind of start walking you through how the scheme is constructed and what it looks like. I'm, and uh, there's, there's, we'll talk about this a little more in a minute. There's actually two different variants of the schema. Um, but the schema is, uh, we fundamentally developed the schema in, as John pointed out earlier, in, in CSDL, uh, the Common Schema Descriptor Language, which is developed by Oasis. And it's that uh, standard schema language. Um, it is not, uh, Redfish actually, and Swordfish, therefore, use a subset of the full OData specification, um, but it does conform, you know, the portion we do use conforms to the, o the OASIS um, OData spec. Um, so, um, there's several items here, and I'll try and remember to highlight them all when I go to the schema. I tried to put little highlights in to remember every point. Um, I may miss one, so bear with me. Um, so th there's a lot of similarities to other languages here and, and other mechanisms for, for defining these things. Um, you know, there's one file per schema type, so volume, uh, pool, uh, uh, class of service, each one of these things has, there's one file for each one of these. So we have 29 or 30, something like that, schema files for Swordfish itself. Um, so each one can pull in external definitions. So, you know, clearly storage service will, you know, it have includes for all of the various things that are in its hierarchy. So volumes and, and, and storage pools and, and storage groups and everything else. Um, so there's an include format, just as you'd expect. Uh, each response contains that OData type, um, and that provides that top-level decoding. So there's a, a, a way to kind of define namespace. Everything inherits from this base type of resource, and then um, when you're looking at the namespace, it'll be, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, uh, something that's like, like here, uh, you know, volume, volume dot volume or volume dot version um, volume dot version dot volume um, shows us a volume entity of a particular version in the volume namespace um, and so there's there's kind of two um, two two versions here like I said you know uh, clearly when you're doing implementations you're going to be um, be, be develop, you know, developers are really going to be dealing a lot with these schemas. Um, purpose, purpose build clients may not be reading the schema directly. Generic clients probably actually want to in order to be doing formatting and dealing with everything properly. Um, in the last session, I talked about uh, 
our basic web client. It is actually, I, the way I, I've been working with the folks building that is I am actually having them read the schema in order to be able to know how to format things. So for example, I'm having them look at the annotations to say, is this property read write or not? They're not looking at, at the specifics of everything, they're just looking at the annotations in order to be able to determine, yep, this one's read write. Okay, I know, I, I know how to mark that one. Um, so, so that kind of thing is right. So that's, this is the same, same uh, kind of guidance here. Um, so, uh, and John mentioned this as well. Uh, all of the standard schema files are published or republished on the DMTF website. So I know one of the things folks are used to seeing from SNEA is that we put all of the stuff on the SNEA website. Well, that's actually different with Swordfish. One of the things we're doing with Swordfish is we're putting our schema files as the primary place we point stuff on the DMTF website. And the reason we're doing that is to make it more convenient for users, um, clients, developers, anyone who wants to see the schema. So our prim you know, the primary place we publish them uh, from a legal perspective is on the SNEA website, but we put them in a zip file. We don't ask people to say, okay, go to DMTF to get all of these schema files and then come over here. And then if you're uh, a vendor, go to your own website. We highly recommend everyone put them on the DMTF website. Um, and there are guidelines for companies, SNEA and everyone else to say, you have to have a primary spot on your own site where you publish your files. But we, we highly, highly, highly recommend that everyone, when you do your implementations, republish through the DMTF portal and put them there because it's so much easier for clients to say, go to one website, find all your schema files there. So um, that's what we're doing. We're recommending to all of our, all of our Swordfish vendors that uh, as folks implement, that they also publish through that portal. Um, we don't have any actually impl you know, live impl real implementations yet um, that have shipped. So there's none out there yet, but we expect to see that. Um, uh, when we do have some implementations, hopefully next year. Um, oh, so not to say, um, also clients and services may also have local copies. So we do expect to see a lot of implementations where people are, are uh, uh, you know, in dark sites, right? Or, you know, have uh, embedded instances or whatever. So we, we do not say only put things out on the DMTF website. Um, it is also you know, good best practice if, to have a local copy. Every instance of every schema, including OEM schemas, OEM being the name, the, the branding, or the, the type, I should say, for um, every, vendor, every vendor specific schema will be versioned. So they will be identical. Um, you can have a local instance of it as well. But uh, so there's no issue with uh, you know, having those be different because they will all be versioned. Did I miss a page? Okay, so schema file types. Um, there's two, they're identical. This is completely up to the developer um, which one they wanna use. Uh, but we do all of our design development um, work in the CSDL and the XML versions. Uh, and then we use tools developed by Redfish, not by us, uh, to uh, convert those over to JSON. Um, those files are identical. I will show you an example of that in a little bit as we walk through what the schema files look like. Um, again, I already said, you know, the common schema defin definition language. Um, I've already said these, these first, <laughs> first few bullet points already. But uh, the JSON, one, one primary difference here is uh, the files are generated dif um, into multiple versions for JSON, um, one per version and in the CSDL and the XML versions, all the version information is in one file. Um, so that's pretty much the only difference in delivery that you will see from them. The information in them is identical, just in different formats. Um, so the JSON follows, you know, the json-schema.org format. Um, it's, but again, it's really just up to your personal preference, which version to use. Um, you know, I'm, I end up looking at the CSDL format 
because that's what we use 99% of the time in, in the technical work group. So I have a hard time looking at the JSON schema <laughs> without trying to make the mental translation back to the other format. So uh, OK, so here's a little bit. And um, I might have made this a tiny bit bigger, but uh, um, Again, you know, you guys are mostly sitting towards the front of the room. So, okay. So we talked a little bit about, you know, some of the some of the elements in here. Um, again, one there's basically one version for um, for each uh, schema type. Um, the uh, this actually is kind of we picked. Uh, this is this is uh, you doing uh, what is this doing? This is doing um, session. It's actually one of the simplest. Simplest objects. It's one of the redfish objects, um, so because it was pretty short uh, and highlighted everything. So we talked earlier about you know they'll include the related objects. So you can see up here, this is what the includes look like. Um, one of the things you'll see. Ooh, let me get the highlighter since I can't reach that high. Um, so you got in, the include formats. Look here. Look up here. Um, some of the basic includes that everything does is pull in these. Uh, um, Basic definitions, the core, uh, OData capabilities, files from um, from uh, Oasis, and the, the core OData definitions. Um, you see these aliases like this, and capabilities. But then you'll also see these are uh, what you know, referencing our own ones. Um, so like this redfish.dmtf schema slash v1 redfish extensions is a re uh, another redfish file. Here's the base resource one that everything inherits from. Um, when it's a swordfish file, it'll be redfish.dmtf slash schemas slash swordfish slash v1, because that's that republication portal where all of our files go. If that was a republication for, say, Broadcoms, um, I would expect that to be like slash schemas slash broadcom slash v1 because we don't we haven't pushed anything out there yet but when we did I would expect that to be a similar structure for uh, republication of various companies um, files so uh, okay so that's basically the includes um, we talked about namespaces and um, so here's the basic format like that so you can see that res that uh, um, entity dot version dot entity to define the namespace down here. You know, it's it's a strange it's a resource dot version dot resource. It's kind of a strange um, strange format, but that's how to specify it. Okay, and so there's some other some other um, elements in here. Oops, where'd I go? Uh, I should look on my own screen here. Um, and then there's a bunch of other fun little things that I didn't really talk through. Like, so there's annotations. Um, so everything is, uh, some of the things that we require are, uh, pretty much everything has to have a description and a long description. Um, this is how we, th these are, you know, basically required, um, required pr uh, properties in the system. Uh, how we define um, properties. I just reused property in a different context there. I apologize. <laughs> so an actual property of the session is defined this way. So you have a property and then a name and then a bunch of annotations here. So again, see this annotation. Um, this is where you'll see things like a permission that says this property is read only. Um, and then in this case, this one's actually also required on create, right? So the username when you create a session, it must be, you must have uh, a username. Uh, and then again, you've got a description and long description. And similarly, password has all those same properties as well. A couple, couple of other kind of redfishy centric things. Um, we talked, you, you had a question um, earlier about uh, where, you know, was there a lot of uh, active management, basically. And I mentioned this notion of actions in here. Actions is a way to reflect, represent functionality that doesn't map well to CRUD. 
Um, and so CRUD, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with that term, is um, a restful notion uh, of how to uh, create, read, update, delete, basically. Um, but anything that doesn't map well to, um, into that notion would be things like reset, right? When you go to, uh, um, or mapping and masking, or some, some fun, oops, sorry, functionality like that, where it's like I, I can't just uh, apply it to an object and have a clearly stateful change to it. Um, there's not a lot of things in the storage space that actually this, this applies to, but this is a really interesting way that Redfish came up with to say, this thing doesn't fit into the model very well. Let's provide an at, you know, a, an obvious way for that thing to be interjected into the system. So we have this notion of actions. Um, and so they're explicitly called out this way. Um, what they actually map to is a post um, that you know tells the system to go off and do this thing. Um, and like I said, we don't have very many of them defined at all in, in Swordfish, but it's a, a notion that you can add anything you have in your system that, that you want to add in explicitly. Um, or if it's a, even if it's an operation that you could map to something else but you want to make obvious, you can also use this mechanism. Um, we wouldn't recommend that, but you, you know, from an OEM perspective, you could do that. Um, and so again, you see property name up here, Oops. property name up here, and then there's a, this uh, OEM actions down here, which I didn't highlight. So there's a space down here in this complex. Um, so these complex types are a way to that basically define. Um, the behaviors of that property. And then there's an OEM actions here, which is where an OEM extending one of these schema can come in and add the action, add their own actions. So there's kind of space. I didn't see regular OEM in here. Oh, there's not an example in here. Uh, in every schema, there's this place, there's an OEM section and an OEM actions so that OEM uh, vendors can come in and basically add additional functionality into every schema. So you don't basically take and create a whole nother copy of it. You basically just add, it, add your own functionality in um, to, to, that, you know, to, that existing, to that existing schema. OK, so the same, ex as I said a couple minutes ago, the schema is identical when it's in JSON. It's converted to this, but everything in, in it just so we can we can kind of look through the Redfish schema here and see on this session that all of the same properties um, and attributes and annotations and everything are converted over. They're just represented in, in the JSON schema format here. So you can see all of that. You know, original OData context ID and type get generated here, and the the references are in place. So ID, oh, so here's the OEM section that I just mentioned, and I forgot to highlight. Um, ID, OEM, and ID are actually inherited from resource. That's why we didn't see them explicitly. Um, one of the things you'll notice about the about the uh, JSON schema is that everything is included explicitly. So anything that's inherited from another schema um, will show up explicitly in the JSON schema. You may not see it in the CSTL schema. So like you see OEM here, you'll see ID. Those came from resource. Uh, description comes from resource. Name comes from resource. So here's a username that we saw earlier. Um, and so you see the same thing, right? Read only true, we saw that. Read only true. Some of those other attributes and annotations don't necessarily come over because JSON doesn't have a notion of those. Okay. 
And then here again is the actions, and then it's got that OEM section underneath it. And Okay, so that was kind of the end of that. Um, so again, we've seen this slide before. Just a reminder, um, snea.org slash swordfish. Is anyone getting sick of me saying that yet? <laughs> um, again, if you're interested in joining the TWIG, talk to, let's see, who all's in the TWIG? Raise your hand. All right, there's about five of it, four or five in here. Um, if you're interested in joining the TWIG, participating, talk to any of us, um, or there are several folks around that, if you're not a member of SNEA, um, that would love to uh, talk to you about joining SNEA. Again, swordfishforums.com, ask any questions you want to there, or there's also a mechanism, uh, storage management at snea.org, you can send us an email. Um, all of this information is on snea.org slash swordfish. And, uh, um, you can always, if you have specific feedback about the spec, you can also send that to snea.org slash feedback. Um, okay, questions?